evening everyone. I hope you all are keeping safe and healthy in these challenging times. I, Atul Khanna, would like to welcome you to today's cold chain webinar, Frozen is the New Fresh, with focus on poultry. I would like to extend a big thank you to the US Soyabean Export Council, USEC, for making this event possible. I would also like to thank the Global Cold Chain Alliance, the Federation of Cold Storage Association of India, USAPEAK, All India ICRA Association and IIAR for supporting this webinar today. Today we have amongst us experts from the cold chain industry who would be sharing their knowledge on various topics related to our theme, Frozen is the New Fresh. With this, I would like to invite Mr. Manjunath MS. An electrical engineer, Mr. Manjunath MS has worked extensively in all types of cold chain projects for the past 30 years, currently working with Cold Chain Consulting as advisor for new business creation and innovation. He is a regular speaker at various cold chain and food preservation conferences and specializes in advisory on new business creation and innovation using his specially designed concept of ideation, exploration and innovation. Over to Mr. Manjunath. Hello, a warm welcome to all of you to this webinar. The theme of this webinar is Frozen is the New Fresh. My name is Manjunath MS. It's my pleasure to moderate this session. With me is a panel of expert speakers who will speak in detail about the various aspects of this theme that Frozen is the New Fresh. It's all about frozen foods. As we move through this webinar, we will get a good understanding of the various processes through which the frozen food goes from a source when it is fresh and then when it is processed and then to the storage, the transportation, the distribution and eventually right up to your home refrigerator or to the freezers in the restaurants. And thereafter, the final step of bringing it back to its original fresh form, uh, which is a process called as thawing. So we will see uh, all these processes a little bit in detail and every speaker who is an expert on one of these aspects of uh, food freezing is going to give their uh, talk on the uh, techniques. Freezing food is after all a food preservation technique. Historically, humans have always tried to find food security because they have suffered a lack of food during uh, droughts, during harsh winters, during wars and especially due to seasonal imbalances of harvests. Not all foods, vegetables or even fish and meats are available throughout the year and it was found essential that uh, they should preserve food. So uh, people started developing various techniques of food preservation and because of these uh, developments we have canning as one of the largest uh, and most accepted uh, process of uh, food preservation. Then there are other techniques like sugar pickling, salt pickling, drying, smoking and yes there is freezing of food too. With the advent of uh, mechanical refrigeration, food freezing and food chilling became a reality. People realized that they can store various kinds of meats and cut vegetables and fruits and fruit pulp over a long period of time just by freezing it. Then they developed certain specific techniques of freezing which resulted in much better quality of uh, frozen foods and uh, that is how the development of frozen foods took place. This webinar may, may not be the, uh, the right place for us to uh, discuss about the technology of food freezing because that's, uh, that 
contains a lot of uh, aspects of microbiology, of physics, of mathematics, uh, heat transfer. So that's uh, really not a part of this webinar, but we are going to take you through the processes of, uh, of uh, food freezing, the process, the technology, the uh, storage, the transportation and those aspects that actually are the practical aspects of a good quality frozen food chain. So the biggest advantage of uh, frozen foods is that they stay in their natural condition just that they are frozen. When we reconstitute, that is when we thaw them back, they come back to their original fresh form without any change in color, in mouthfeel, in the nutrition content and in the texture. So this is a big advantage over the other forms of uh, food uh, preservation. It's interesting to note that uh, the frozen food market in India is likely to grow at a CAGR of 17% between 2019 and 2024. So it's evident that uh, frozen food is making big inroads into the Indian food ecosystem with its uh, advantages of convenience and fresh on demand. Also, e-commerce is a big driver to frozen food distribution and uh, reach to every part of the country. So let's look at the advantages of frozen food. There are three distinct advantages of frozen food. Number one is that frozen food is safe and hygienic. Number two, frozen food lasts for a very long time. It has an excellent shelf life of anywhere between three months to 18 months and even more for certain uh, specific uh, uh, products. The third advantage of uh, frozen food is that you get fresh on demand. It means that at any point of time, a frozen food within its shelf life period can be thawed back, can be reconstituted back to its original fresh form by a technique called as thawing. I will be speaking about it a little later in this webinar. So now coming to the main point, this webinar will tell you how these three advantages of frozen foods come to be into this products. How are they built into this product? And that's the uh, part that my uh, successive speakers are going to talk about. But I shall give you one slide which actually depicts the entire process of frozen foods from its point of source to your home refrigerator through a small block diagram, which is just a single slide. And then every speaker will take up each part of this slide and speak in detail about it. So here is the slide. So you see this green uh, box, which is the fresh produce that actually comes from the farm or it is freshly harvested. Even if you look at poultry, poultry, there are various frozen foods. Let's, let me just give you an example of frozen foods. We have green peas, we have poultry, uh, chicken that is uh, frozen, then we have ice creams, a lot of other dairy products like butter and paneer, and then we have uh, um, fish, frozen fish, frozen, frozen prawns, and then we have uh, frozen shrimps. So several of these uh, products, but what we plan to do in this webinar is to take at least one example, uh, which can be then shared by all the speakers and will speak about one particular product. So we thought we will take uh, uh, frozen poultry, which is frozen chicken meat, uh, because there are a lot of misconceptions about frozen uh, chicken and we would like to, you know, uh, give you a good idea about uh, uh, a frozen poultry. Nevertheless, I mean, any, any uh, product would go through more or less similar processes of hygiene and then uh, the, the second advantage of uh, long shelf life and the third advantage of freshness by thawing. So we are going to talk about all these processes. So here is the slide. The fresh produce then goes for removal of harmful microbial content. This is exactly where we have the issue of hygiene coming in. Now you can see uh, hygiene on the top of removal of harmful bacterial content. That's the first step in the uh, processing of frozen foods. Thereafter, the produce is either packed or it is portioned, it is cut, portioned, packed, and then it is frozen. You can see that the next step is uh, the process, the entire processing uh, part of it. And then it goes into the freezing aspect. 
and after freezing it goes to storage and then after storage it is transported to various places as a part of the business process so you can see here now you can see the entire part from processing till the time it reaches your home refrigerator this all these blue boxes that you see is an unbroken cold chain and that's the that's the journey in which the temperature of the produce is kept below minus 20 degrees celsius all through the process so we'll have the next speaker speaking about the hygiene and the processing part of it then we have two speakers who are going to speak about freezing and storage and uh, types of storage and storage conditions etc then we have a specialist uh, on transportation who will speak on the transportation techniques and then the distribution retail uh, stores point of sale and then your home refrigerator is something that i will come back and cover right up to the part of cooking and consumption which is the thawing part of it so you can see on this slide all the three aspects the three advantages which we said was hygiene a long shelf life and then freshness on demand frozen is the new fresh all these three advantages you will uh, see through this particular journey i now welcome our first speaker rajiv jaisingani to speak on the first step of the processing part of frozen foods over to rajiv hi i am rajiv jaisingani managing director of darshan foods private limited we produce meat products under the brand name of meatsa and euro by meatsa for our production we source chicken mutton and pork from producers in india and across the world currently we are sourcing our chicken and mutton from quality producers in india while we are sourcing our pork from europe the plants that we source our chicken and mutton from are ISO 22000 and FSSC 22000 certified before sourcing from these plants our quality team conducts a full audit of these plants to ensure that we are supplied the products that are approved by us for our production as per our standards similarly when our customers buy from us they to audit our plant to ensure that we are meeting their quality standards the plants that we currently buy from have their own farms where they use premium breed of birds and feed to ensure proper quality that is supplied to us bird and animal health is monitored throughout the plants work as per international standards in terms of slaughter process and hygiene post slaughter the birds are chilled and deboned as per our specifications the meat is frozen and packed in cartons and dispatched in reefer trucks to our plant along with certificate of analysis when we receive the meat at our plant our quality team analyzes it to ensure that it meets the quality standards that we have approved the quality team also approves all other ingredients like fresh vegetables seasonings spices and packaging materials that are used in the plant this ensures the final quality of our finished product our boneless products are cooked to a core temperature of 75 degrees centigrade while our bone in products are cooked to a core temperature of plus 80 degrees centigrade this ensures that we get best quality product with minimal bacterial load which is most important to us the products are then packed in food grade packaging material and frozen at minus 40 degrees centigrade packed cartons are maintained at minus 18 degrees centigrade before shipping the frozen product are transported to our various offices and customers in reefer trucks to ensure proper product quality as a hygiene practice all our workers wear hair covers face mask and use nitrile gloves to handle food products this has always been the practice at our plant currently when the workers report for work the temperatures are monitored at the entry gate itself and sanitizer are given to them there once they are in the plant they change into uniform and get to the processing area as per company policy if a worker is found to be of unfit health he is sent back and his details noted when he reports for work breaks his health is monitored closely to ensure that there is no problem social distancing is currently being maintained at the plant as per standards set by the government 
whenever there is a health issue like what we are facing currently with covid-19 the focus of the customer immediately moves to hygiene we as a company are taking steps to ensure that the trust of our customers in the quality of our products is maintained the customer perceives a branded product to be more hygienic compared to a product without a brand they also feel that the due diligence of the quality would be done by the brand which settles their unsettled mind during such a period frozen is the new fresh because quick freezing locks in the freshness and will ensure that quality wins let's choose frozen because we always want to give our best to the family thanks rajiv i now welcome our overseas guest speaker dan kaplan dan is an eminent speaker on uh, food frozen food storages and warehouse management systems and techniques over to dan Hello, my name is Daniel Kaplan, and I've been uh, asked to speak about operational considerations for warehouses that move from handling annual horticultural commodities to more expensive and faster turning frozen foods and protein items. I've been in the cold storage business for 30 years as an owner, operator, officer of Cloverleaf Cold Storage, which until recently was the fifth largest cold storage warehouse in North America. Ours was a family business, which started in this warehouse, where I also started in the business in the 1970s. This was an older facility that had been converted from a production plant into a cold storage warehouse. Many years ago, we used to hand stack slow turning commodities on the floor of the warehouse, up on dividers, so there was air circulation under the product. Not much of a problem. I understand many of your warehouses have air plenum space under the floors as it is. As labor became more expensive and product turned faster, we switched to handling product on pallets with forklifts and stacking that product on the floor. Always a concern in these older facilities was the floor loading. And as you move to certain heavy frozen commodities, in this case, frozen butter, you had to be aware of floor loading and not overstack the floors. That was a painful lesson for us. Of course, over the years, we built many newer facilities. This particular one in Illinois was, was built about five years ago and held 30,000 metric tons of product fully racked. Now, as you make this change to handling faster turn and turning frozen foods and proteins, uh, you're dealing with more expensive items. The values having grown significantly, the expectations of the customers will change and the amount of information and the amount of services customers may request may be anticipated to be greater than have been handled in the past. It all begins really at receipt of product. In our own facilities, we would record, the first thing we would record would be the truck line who brought the product to us. Sometimes issues would arise and it was always helpful to know who had brought you to load. But we would also gather all this additional information at the time of receipt. Seal numbers, because all trucks came to us with seals to help prevent tampering or theft. If the seal had been broken or if the seal was intact, that was noted. Of course, a product description and almost all products these days have a code that is of meaning and, and significance to the customer. Customers will frequently order by product code. We would also capture and record any date information on the packages. This might be a production date or an expiry date, and closely associated with that would be the customer's production number, or batch, or lot number. The warehouse would have to have its own lot number for the load, and we would count the product on receipt. It was a blind count done at the dock, and I'll talk about counts in a moment. Other things we would note would be temperatures. We would take three temperatures on the load in the tail, in the middle, and at the nose of the load. And that way we could establish if product was fully frozen when it arrived at the warehouse, or if it had been subjected to temperature abuse in transit. Weights were taken. Now, many products come with the same weight on every box. A, a box of chicken parts, for example, might always be 20 kilograms. But many times product, particularly bone-in product, would have different weights on every box. And when the product leaves your facility, 
you may have to capture these weights so that the owner can accurately invoice his customer for the weight of product actually being delivered. At the time of receipt, we would notice and notify the customer of any damaged product, but also overages and shortages. So back to counts. We would do a blind count at receipt, meaning that the warehouseman who was unloading and counting product off the truck did not know what the count should be. Count was checked again as product was put away in the warehouse, and these two counts were then compared to the count on the manifest that came with a load. If there was a discrepancy, a supervisor or manager would go out and check the load himself. At the end of the day, overages, shortages, and any damage would be reported to the customer at the time of receipt. One other thing to keep in mind is if product is coming on pallets, particularly if you're going to store the product on pallets, you have to account for the pallets because they have a value. Sometimes if you receive 20 pallets on a truck, the expectation is you'll put 20 empty pallets back on the driver's truck when he leaves. Otherwise, you might credit the customer's account 20 pallets, and then when you ship product, you would charge their account for the pallet shipped, and at some point in the future, you would have to make good on pallets. Now, customers have higher expectations for inventory information as the product gets more valuable. In this example, you could see the blue arrow pointing at one particular item, haddock. There was, at the time this inventory was printed, there was one load of that product in the warehouse. The leftmost column was the customer's batch identification, and the, co the column to the right of that was our lot number. In the red box, you can see we have two different lot numbers relating to one customer batch. It's probably be because it came to us on two separate loads. And each load, maybe they even arrived on different days, each load got its own lot number. That would help us with rotation and, of course, for billing and date of receipt so we could do billing correctly. In this next slide, we've added another column, and that's the, the establishment number. In the United States, all poultry and meat products are produced by uh, facilities that have their own unique establishment numbers provided by the government. This may be true for different items in India as well, and in the event of some kind of tracing or recall, the ability to search for product by establishment number can be critical. The next thing to consider is rotation. When you ship product for this customer, how do they want you to rotate it? When we handled just you know annual commodities like corn or peas, customers didn't really care. The 2019 year was the 2019 year. We could just ship the next product that was easy to reach. But as you deal with other items, customers have different expectations. They may want you to rotate strictly on the basis of first in, first out. The first lot you received will be the first lot you shipped. But they may also ask that you ship the oldest product by production date or the soonest to expire. If you're receiving product out of rotation from a customer, you need to be able to search your databases, your inventory, to find which is the next product to ship. And sometimes the customer will want you to use different rules depending on their customer. They may want their best customers to receive the newest product, and in other cases, you ship the oldest product. As product values increase, customers may want to come to your facilities more often to check product, and it's important that your sanitation and your pest control be best in class so that you have the highest confidence from your customers. These two pictures, I'm trying to demonstrate two things. The picture to the right was taken in a facility in India. Now, in the United States, we're very strict that poison is used for pest control outside the building and certainly outside the storage areas. Inside storage areas and loading docks, we only use traps because we don't want poison to contaminate the food. You can see in this photograph, circled in red, a bait station of poison laid out right next to apples in crates. This is not good practice, and I urge you to make sure that your pest control is up to best practices. The picture on the left is a warehouseman in an uh, American facility. He's actually pointing at damage in the racking, but what I would like you to notice is what's circled in his right hand, because every time your people walk through the facility, and every time you walk through your facility, I hope that you're setting an example for cleanliness by picking up debris.
as you walk. Now, as product is received and as product is shipped, you need to cull out damaged product. This is something that you need to determine with your customers. What is damage? It's not always easy to determine. In this slide, we're looking at acceptable product as we would teach our warehousemen. Some crushing, some minor scuffs and tears on the boxes can be acceptable. A hole in a box may even be acceptable if the product inside is in poly and the poly is intact. Now in this next slide, we're looking at what we considered unacceptable damage with excessive crushing, punctures or tears that go through the inner lining of the product. When we receive product into the warehouse that is damaged, we never receive it onto our books that way. We let the customer know that the product was damaged. We're receiving the lot short. And based on the customer expectations, we might hold the damage or we might refuse it back to the truck. This again is something you need to be agreed upon with your customers. Now, understanding storage requirements and particularly temperatures uh, that apply when you're handling more valuable frozen foods and proteins. Generally speaking, you're safe at about 17 or 18 degrees below zero centigrade. This is good for almost all commodities, but you know, ice cream colder, typically we would store that at negative 28 centigrade. Now, this is well below the freezing point for most commodities. Poultry, after all, changes state from frozen uh, to frozen from fresh at about two and a half degrees centigrade uh, below. So why do we maintain colder? First of all, because not all spoilage action stops as the product reaches its freezing point. Spoilage has slowed down and we want to achieve the freezing point as quickly as possible. But product will not maintain its highest quality at those temperatures. You need to get to lower temperatures, again, about minus 17, minus 18 centigrade in order to stop most spoilage. The second reason is because of temperature fluctuations. Temperatures do fluctuate in your warehouse, commonly because of defrost or because you have energy management going on and there's times you're shutting down if, if power is more expensive for a few hours. Now those fluctuations for defrost and power management can affect the product. They cause the growth of larger ice crystals within the product. They can also affect color and flavor. But as you achieve colder temperatures, the fluctuations do less damage. And you will not have damage with normal three to four degree centigrade variations if you're down about negative 17 degrees. Now in this picture, you're looking at a segment out of the WFLO's Commodity Storage Manual and it's showing some storage times for various poultry products at those temperatures. I'd also like you to note at the bottom, the shaded area that talks about the damage that can be done from slow freezing. So suppose you have a customer one day and they have a processed poultry product. They come to you and say, I've, my product has been damaged. You might do some research in the commodity storage manual and discover that that's the kind of damage that occurred earlier in the process, perhaps at the exporting country. This slide is looking at the temperature requirements for frozen French fried potatoes. And again, you see that you have large, or, or I should say long storage periods at appropriate storage temperatures. Finally, here's a slide out of the commodity storage manual that talks about the damage that can happen from dropping potatoes. Now, this is not a, a lesson in handling French fries. The point of this slide is to say that if you're handling products you have not previously handled, it's really excellent to look up in the commodity storage manual and see what you can learn about the proper handling for those items. The commodity storage manual is a benefit to membership in the IARW in India, and it's a tremendous resource that I urge you to look at and use carefully. Now in closing, I wanna remind you of something which I'm sure you know. The frozen food industry in India is expected to grow very rapidly in the coming years, and I'm sure you want to be a part of it. For the industry to really succeed in convincing customers and for customers to rely upon the industry and trust the industry, you have to have a well-trained staff, you have to use the best practices, and you have to listen to your customers. One great concern is that the customer base will not appreciate and respect the cold storage industry and will build their own facilities. And you cannot compete with a customer once they have built their own freezer. Thank you. 
Thanks, Dan, for such a wonderful insight uh, into uh, the aspects of, uh, you know, storage and uh, st warehouse management uh, techniques and systems. I now welcome Harshal Surange. Harshal is a consultant and he will be speaking on the uh, freezing process and the refrigeration equipment for freezing. Hello and welcome. <clears throat> Thank you Manjunath uh, for handing over and thanks to Dan for uh, the previous session. My name is Harshal Surange and I'm the director and CEO of ACR Project Consultants Private Limited, which is a firm into consulting, cold chain consulting for the mass, uh, past almost 50 years. Uh, we have done more than 500 cold storage cold chain projects, designed more than those many projects uh, all over uh, the country. Uh, I am myself also uh, an impanel consultant with the Asian Development Bank and the World Food Logistics Organization as a cold chain expert. So the topic that we have today is the technological aspects of, of this whole uh, freezing and you know uh, frozen food stores and everything. But before we get into that, uh, there's the first slide that I would like to show you, which is basically explaining the process of freezing. Now, what is freezing? Freezing per se has, has is a three part process. You know, the first part is actually bringing the product from that given temperature, which could be 20 degrees, 25 degrees, whatever, up to the point where it starts freezing. So that is the first step. The second step is where it converts from liquid to uh, ice stage. Now, when we say freezing, we are basically talking of water, which is inside the product that is getting frozen so it's the water content in the product which is getting frozen so that converts from a liquid to ice this process is basically a, a more or less constant temperature process where the temperature doesn't really go down it stays at that level which is generally in the range of say between two minus two and a half to minus three degrees celsius and that after that once it has completely converted to uh, ice or its solid form then the process to bring it to the final temperature which is normally minus 18 or minus 20 degrees celsius that is the process which you can see here now if you see the the particular diagram you will see that that there is a, a line which is coming straight down which is basically the initial pull down where the temperature is coming to the freezing point after that is the latent heat portion now, if you see the amount of time taken by this latent heat portion, it is significant. Now, why is it significant? Because actually the energy required for conversion of this particular uh, liquid into ice is a very high amount of energy. Now, this could be significantly more in terms of proportion. So if you're talking of 100% uh, requirement, then maybe 70 to 80% or even higher could be the energy required just for this freezing portion. Of course, different products have different amount of water content in them. So that again, that it, it varies because of that. But broadly, you would say it's a very significant portion of, uh, of energy required just for the freezing process. So understanding this whole concept that, that it is freezing, which is important, is, is, uh, is something that we need to understand. Why I'm specifically saying this is because we have seen cases where, uh, you know, people have asked us that we find that, you know, the frozen food store is, is consuming a lot of energy and why is it happening? So when we, you know, go ahead and ask them further as to what are they storing, in many cases we have seen that there are products which come actually at plus 5 and plus 10 degrees Celsius, which they are keeping inside the frozen store. So in that case, you are actually spending the energy to freeze that product in your frozen food store. Now we'll be talking a little bit about quick freezing and slow freezing. Again, putting your product at plus five or plus 10 into a, a frozen food store effectively is slow freezing. So you're not doing great to the product. At the same time, you are spending significantly higher amount of energy from your uh, frozen food store or the deep freeze unit what we might call and that energy it's not your frozen food store is actually not designed for that 
you know you are putting a plus temperature product in a minus temperature chamber also tends to disturb the temperature conditions of the other products in there so uh, that's what we are we are really trying to say that the energy consumption if you are putting uh, such positive temperature products in a frozen food store can be high it can be significantly higher also depending on how much product you are putting in but it's a very important point as i have said we have already seen cases where people have tried to put butter which is at plus 5 and plus 10 degrees into a cold storage and then they are they are wondering as to why their uh, you know consumption is going so high and well it is obvious that is going to high, go high because you are doing the freezing inside your cold store and that's where <clears throat> this whole concept of of uh, you know getting the best energy out of your system comes up because uh, the more or the lesser is your temperature when the product comes in if your if you have a good temperature of product say if your product is coming in at minus 15 or minus 16 then bringing it to that minus 17 minus 18 minus 20 is very quick whereas if the product is coming in actually in in uh, in plus temperature or in non frozen state then you are going to be spending huge amount of additional energy in that uh, in that whole process uh moving to the next slide you would see this is basically talking more about fast freezing and slow freezing uh manjunath has earlier spoken about this but i just put a little more uh, additional information that uh, you know when when you do fast freezing you're basically bringing the temperature down very quickly and that helps uh, in terms of keeping the flavor keeping all that uh, the juice so to say of the product and it doesn't allow the the freshness to go away whereas keeping any product directly into your in the in the uh, deep freezer of your refrigerator at home is is basically slow freezing uh there are a few points which you would see in terms of microbial growth there are uh, is better prevention in this case and uh, not so much in the other case size of crystals it's lower time right moving to the types of freezers uh this is this is generic information so i won't be spending too much time on this uh this this information you can get from anywhere in the market you know you have uh, quick freezers uh, different types of them you have direct immersion freezers you have contact plate freezers uh horizontal or vertical plates then you have the regular blast freezer which are basically uh using air movement uh which can either be a batch process or it can be a tunnel process so you are going to have very uh, fast air moving around at very cold air it could be in the range of minus 35 minus 40 and this air is moving very quickly over uh, the product and that helps it in in bringing the temperature down in terms of contact freezers it is actually uh, contacting the product so there is refrigerant inside the plate and that is actually physically touching the product and that is where the the energy transfer is happening then you have iqf which is individual quick freezing now individual quick freezers are basically uh, meant for smaller product sizes where like peas corn you know small chicken wings or whatever so uh, these are smaller products which go onto a belt typically this belt will have uh, very cold air flowing on top of it and either on top of it or it is flowing through it so that the product is actually dancing on top of uh, the belt uh this again brings individual products to a very low uh, temperature that is minus 18 core in in a small period of time and this helps in uh, keeping the product separate because in a blast freezer many times if the products are kept inside a tray and if that is uh, if that is frozen together it tends to form uh, a bulk and then of course there are cryogenic freezers which go into very low uh temperatures uh moving to refrigeration system there are some important things that need to be considered of course we don't have too much time to go into detail but i'm just putting up some uh, some key points the initial design of the system is a very key point it it is the most important thing i would say that if your design is right you are able to uh, get a get a proper hands on uh, good looking system the parameters that you choose when you are going for such a design is again very critical uh, simple changes 
in parameters uh, if you see the it's, it's i've even given here that uh, even 1 degree difference in the parameters can make a difference of between 2 to 3 percent so if you increase your evaporation by 1 degree you are going to get a better uh, you know power consumption by almost 2 to 3 percent similar thing happens for condensation if you go for a lower condensation you are going to get a better power consumption on a broad scale a well designed plant and a not so well designed plant i do not want to take um, any kind of liberty in in saying that there are bad designs no design is a bad design but there's a well designed plant and a not so well designed plant the difference can be huge between two cases giving the same output it could be as much as double in terms of power consumption of course there are well, multiple parameters that look into all this and that is something that that is part of a designer's prerogative but that's something that uh, needs to be understood that this is what is a key requirement to understand this whole point that parameter selection at the initial stage by the right person is very important uh, see there have been a lot of cases which uh, where you know whether you should use ammonia whether you should use freon what you know as of now there is always a big discussion on this uh, just to put it in a short uh, in a short frame ammonia is a natural refrigerant so it is not going to get phased out it could have restrictions in terms of usage in city limits but ammonia will fundamentally not get phased out because it is natural refrigerant it has zero odp and practically zero gwp so ammonia is not going anywhere that is one thing for sure hfcs which is freons uh, the phase down is going to start in india in 2028 and uh, from 2028 to 2047 there is going to be a stepwise phase down at the same time now we have newer refrigerants called hfos which uh, again have significantly lower gwps than uh, hfcs which is a good thing again this slide also is trying to remove all these myths that uh, you know with if you are having an ammonia system then you have to go with water cooled now nowadays we have done plants with air cooled ammonia also without any problem so uh, just just trying to get the myths removed and a small future trend that i see which can be used in india is uh, you know ammonia co2 cascade systems that is something uh, in the long run we can look at because there is going to be significant power saving in this kind of system uh, moving to thermal insulation you know that is amongst the very important and critical portions of uh, of any plant why i am saying very important because it is the thing that works 24/7 uh, it has it has no rest as long as your cold room or your frozen store is operational um, insulation is going to keep working it is the most critical element uh, another important thing that i want to put here is you know so many times we have seen that in frozen stores there are blocks of ice which are created because of uh, there are some gaps in the insulation then there is moisture coming in and it, it creates a it creates a block of ice <clears throat> what happens uh, in that is is that this block of ice is considered as as load or cooling load by the coil and it is actually working more to ensure that the ice remains ice so we need to make sure that the ice actually goes out and that crack is sealed rather than leaving the ice there many times people actually say that well ice actually is an is an insulator you know it, it stops air from moving but this is another problem one important point again which you will see a video immediately after this a very small video which i had taken on one of my visits uh, to a different uh, frozen food store is that strip curtains which are physical barriers are very important for a, a frozen food store you know it physically stops moisture from getting into your chamber and you will see it in this video how it uh, it makes a big difference so what you saw in this video was that 
the air was coming in so rapidly into the chamber uh, with a strip curtain that would have been avoided that is the key point that you need to look at from this the next uh, the next thing that i'm going to be talking of uh, is is about energy saving and green concepts this is a very large topic so i'm not spending like significantly high amount of time on this uh, just the pointers you know freezing is is a very expensive process so energy saving is extremely critical you have to have very good uh, thermal insulation you have to have a very efficient uh, energy refrigeration system you have to have e efficient material movement again material movement has to be in a proper enclosure where the temperature is controlled otherwise you do all this effort of creating a frozen thing and and then leave it in the open it doesn't make sense proper product size and loading why this concept of size comes in because in a blast freezer uh, you know the time taken by any product to reach its core temperature is dependent uh, on the size of the product if it's a bigger product is going to take much longer than a smaller product then recycled water uh, you should try and use as far as possible use a heat recovery system wherever you have the need of of uh, some hot water natural ventilation natural light wherever possible and use of renewable energy these days solar is is a very good option uh, you have a lot of uh, chances to use solar as one of the uh, one aid in helping uh, efficient operations and then of course as i said earlier also you know trying to ensure that uh, that the parameters are kept as much as possible you know you may have designed uh, on one side but even operating wise you have to make sure that those parameters are maintained like your evaporation temperature condensing temperature sub cooling of liquid refrigerant superheating of suction gas heat transfer at evaporator and condenser presence of non condensables in the system presence of water in the system you know all these things come into picture now there was another point that i was told to discuss uh which was more to do with conversion of a chilled chamber to a frozen chamber now this is frankly uh we've done this earlier not that it's uh totally not doable you can do this but it is important to understand that uh, it's a difficult thing to do and if possible your first point that i want to make is try going for a new chamber for frozen instead of converting an existing chilled chamber that is that is my first uh, recommendation if if you really want to do something try generating some space and make a new chamber now if you must go for conversion you have to understand that your regular chilled chambers will typically have insulation suitable for chilled which means the insulation thickness is going to be smaller while you can add on some insulation onto your walls and your ceiling it's very difficult to add on insulation to your floor how you will have to actually remove the entire floor and put additional insulation or try and go below that floor and you know do some jugglery to make sure that your insulation is continuous at the same time your wall insulation reaching the floor insulation is also equally critical now assume for a minute that your insulation was pre planned and you already have uh, a good insulation in place then the next important thing to be checked is whether the cooling unit has been planned as a frozen food store because there are many parameters uh, like your air flows like your like the capacity of the coil itself like your fin spacing and so many other parameters which basically need to be matched with the revised requirement that you're going to have uh because of of this conversion so that needs to be checked then your refrigeration system on the back side you might need to add a compressor because if you are working as chill you will probably not have a, a, a low stage compressor you may need to add a low stage compressor you have to check whether there is a chance if it's an ammonia ammonia system then it is easily possible if it is a freon system i don't think that's going to be possible single stage double stage yes you may want to add a double stage compressor entirely into the system if you are going for freon you might need to add uh, a completely new uh, compressor uh, again 
there are so many times this question comes up can i use it as both as a chilled as well as frozen you know when i want it so all these questions will be based on the system design how the system has been originally planned and what can be done in terms of new uh, one thing is for sure there is definitely more flexibility in ammonia uh, in to be able to do something like this and uh, relatively less in in uh, any other system but yeah it all depends on system to system and and we can't really make a generic case out of it so yeah uh, here we are uh, what we have to say is you have to save energy save the environment and try to make the world a better place to live in we are moving towards uh, more demand on frozen food stores you know as as manjunath even uh, said earlier and and i think even later on he's going to talk a little bit about thawing this whole process of freezing is going to be uh, very critical uh, proper freezing proper thawing if you are able to match the two you will definitely be able to uh, use that product for a significantly longer period of time and in terms of this whole point that uh, you know we are moving now towards a world where uh food security is going to be a very critical thing uh, i think frozen is one one big way in which uh, we are going to be able to help the world thank you thank you so much for listening harshil thanks uh, it was a great uh, talk that you offered i now welcome uh, our fourth speaker uh, pankaj mehta pankaj is a as an expert on uh, food transportation systems Uh, especially the um, frozen food and uh, temperature uh, control logistics part of it uh, welcome pankaj over to you hello everyone i hope everybody is keeping safe and healthy i represent carrier transi cold and i'm proud to say that this month we are completing 50 years of innovative transport refrigeration systems on the slide one we will see that carrier transi cold has over 1 million systems working around the globe helping to preserve protect and improve the global supply chain of perishable food and pharmaceutical systems across rail sea going containers and road systems Moving on to the next slide let's see what is the cold chain my colleagues before me have already spoken about the need for cold chain let me talk a little bit about the distribution or the transport refrigeration transport refrigeration largely could be long haul high volume uh, product distribution or it could be last mile smaller trucks or vans carrying products to the retail stores Let's see what are some of the purposes why we design transport refrigeration. So the purpose of transport refrigeration is to maintain the temperature of the product. It is not to cool down. What I mean is that the set point at which you set the product, the unit will only maintain it at that set point. And uh, good air distribution is one of the most uh, important factors to maintain proper temperature across the container moving ahead we will see some of the other uh, challenges that uh, we face while uh, we consider a good and efficient transport refrigeration the box insulation the k factor of the insulation is uh, very important because it helps maintain the cooling inside the box so uh, that is something that we need to take care the design of the box the k factor uh, the temperature set point at which we are loading the product and uh, also uh, other aspects like proper uh, distribution proper uh, processes when to open the container when to close so you can see some of the factors listed on the slides and also the solutions that we would recommend i think one of the simplest ones to take care is following proper loading practices when we are handling transport refrigeration so let's understand a little bit more about good loading practices for a efficient transport refrigeration system so basically it's a four step process 
Step one is to pre-cool the container. Make sure that the container is not lying in the sun. It is lying in a shade to avoid any heat ingress coming from the ambient sunlight. Keep the unit running and bring down the container temperature close to the set point. Step two is make sure that the product is also at the set point and is lying ready to be loaded at an insulated parking area, loading bay. Step three is the actual loading process. Before loading, we need to make sure that we shut down the unit before we open the doors. What happens is if we open the doors and the unit is running, the cold air which is heavier tends to rush out and is replaced by ambient air which is hotter and has a lot of moisture. Now this leads to many complications. The moisture goes on to the coils, it leads to frosting, the system goes into a defrost cycle and there is a lot of chaos. So to avoid all that, make sure you shut down the unit, then you open the doors and you load the product. The loading time has to be minimal. And the fourth step is you again close the doors, restart the unit and you are ready to go. Going ahead, let's understand a little bit more about how we are expected to load the product. The first thing is don't mix products at different temperatures. If you are having frozen and chilled products, make sure they are divided in separate compartments. Uh, these days there is a lot of tendency to use fan air distribution from one compartment to another. For hygiene reasons that are not recommended, so there are specific multi-temperature systems in case you want to carry two products, one frozen, one chilled in the same box. We recommend that you use a proper multi-temperature system for that. When we load uh, the cartons or the pallets in the box, what is the general tendency is that we load too tight. You will see from the slide some of the examples of improper loading. We don't leave space on the top. Uh, you block the evaporator which can cause short cycling. There is not enough space for the cold air to move about. Uh, same with the uh, gaps on the side and at the rear. We need to ensure that there is proper space available between the pallet and the container wall to allow the air to move about freely. We must understand that air distribution is essential to maintain the proper temperature and to ensure that there are no hot spots created anywhere across the length of the container. You can imagine that these are long 32 feet, 40 feet containers and if we don't permit air to go right up to the length of the container, it's highly possible that you have hot spots developing somewhere and the product at the hot spot will definitely not be in the best condition. So to ensure a uniform distribution of air, we need to make sure that the product loading is proper leave space from the top, leave space from the sides and from the rear door. Going on to the next slide, all I can say is that it is a chain, cold chain uh, is called a chain because the strength of the chain is in the weakest link and uh, most of the time it is a transport refrigeration bit which is improperly handled and that becomes the weakest link and that's where the chain breaks and the product gets spoiled. That's it from my side. Thank you. Thanks Pankaj. Uh, now I, would, I will take you uh, through the uh, last part which is the retail stores. From large distribution centers, the product is then sent, the frozen product is then sent to retail stores and point of sale. It could be some of the supermarkets where there are large island freezers. These are all maintained at below minus 20 degrees Celsius and then this product is brought and kept there in the form of first to expire first out. That's the usual way in which it should be stored uh, by these uh, supermarket uh, stores. So uh, before you pick up your product, frozen product, please check the expiry date. Please check the manufacturing date. Very important for you to know if that is within this particular period. And if you are going to consume it uh, before the safe expiry date, then I think uh, it's perfectly fine. These, these are the uh, simple, uh, you know, 
precautions or uh, SOPs that you should exercise whenever you pick up something from the freezers in the point of sale. Once you bring it to your home, then please put it into the deep freezer compartment of your refrigerator and uh, the setting should be at least uh, uh, maximum which says about minus 20 degrees Celsius. Now the important part is the thawing and the thawing actually gets you the, this particular freshness on demand what we say frozen is the fresh, new fresh. It's, it's here that you experience this particular statement. So thawing is a technique by which you take out a frozen product from its package or sometimes you keep it in the package and then do the thawing and thawing is a process by which you actually raise the temperature of the particular frozen uh, product gradually over a period of time. So there are different thawing techniques. One of the uh, most uh, common and widely accepted technique for uh, thawing is to take out the frozen uh, package, put it in a tray and keep it into your chiller, into the chiller uh, uh, of your uh, uh, refrigerator. That means into the last bottommost compartment of your refrigerator and keep it for a period of 12 to 14 hours. Say suppose tomorrow you want to do the, uh, you want to cook the uh, product, then the best thing is to keep it by today evening, take it out of the deep freezer keep it in a tray and put the tray in the lowermost compartment of your refrigerator where the temperature can be anywhere between uh, 6 degrees to 12 degrees. So keep it there over the night over about 12 to 14 hours this will thaw gradually and you will get a very very fresh product next day morning for cooking. Remember one thing once you have thawed a product do not refreeze it by putting it back into the freezing compartment please do not refreeze a thawed product. So once thawing has been done, it is, it is ready for cooking. So this is a simple uh, standard operating procedure. You could even put these uh, frozen products into water, normal water at normal temperature. That will also increase the temperature of the frozen product. But then uh, the, uh, the procedure is to change that water every 30 minutes. There are other techniques like putting it into a microwave, there are radio frequency techniques and there are high voltage uh, uh, electrical techniques to uh, thaw the products, several of them are there. But the, the most accepted and widely used one is to thaw it within the refrigerator, doesn't require any specific uh, uh, vessel or anything except a tray in which you put this and keep it into the, uh, into the bottom most uh, compartment of your refrigerator. We are all eaters. Whether it's grab and go or gourmet, the food we eat matters. We all want food that's nutritious, delicious, and above all, safe. That's why we take what we do so seriously. Because to us, it's more than a meal. It's our promise. We work to ensure the food we all eat is safe, safely stored, safely packaged, safely shipped. This is our commitment to support every link in the cold chain to ensure the food we all eat is kept at the proper temperature until it reaches its final destination. This is our vow. We preserve more than food. We preserve trust. By keeping the industry's food products safe, reliable, and ready to eat. By serving the manufacturers, producers, and companies we work with. By protecting the foods families love. Because we know that it's not just farm to table. Sometimes it's farm to factory, to warehouse, to truck, to grocery store to table. Because it's not just fresh or frozen, it's fresh and frozen. We advance improvements in technology, in transportation, and in storage. We invest in the infrastructure that keeps the cold chain strong. And we do it because the food that's on your table is the food that's on our table too. We're more than just a link in the supply chain. We are the cold chain. Proven partners in food safety.